Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to another episode of Who Knew in the Moment podcast. Today, I'm uh, super excited to have Des Moines Adams on, and uh, Des Moines a, a friend of mine, but as, you, as you'll find out, he's a very accomplished man himself. Uh, Des Moines a national champion uh, football, collegiate football winner, played professional football, <laughs> dancing with the stars winner, and then uh, now uh, he does public speaking as well. And uh, the things I would say about Des Moines um, that are probably more important to me than those accolades are uh, just a great guy, great friend, and even be better uh, husband and uh, dad. So Des Moines, super excited to have you on today, man. Hey, thanks for having me, Phil. Happy Friday. Happy New Year, by the way. That's right. Absolutely. So Des Moines, once again, we've got a long list of things to go through today, and I'm excited <laughs> to hear all of uh, how they came to be. But um, you're originally from Arkansas. And so talk to me a little bit about being from Arkansas and how you kind of got started playing football and what that looked like. Yeah, you know, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, born and raised. Um, you know, I would say um, opportunities always, pre you know, presented themselves. But uh, for me to get to Nebraska, I had to put myself out there. I was maybe a two, three star athlete, wasn't the best student. Um, but, you know, I was a good kid, played played around in the streets with my friends, every sport, always had dreams of playing in the NFL, NBA, baseball, so to speak. We did have a um, neighborhood hero. His name was Tory Hunter. Hey, okay. Draft. Yeah, got drafted right out of high school, went to the Minnesota Twins, and, you know, he really set the bar, but also somewhat set a standard in terms of here's what you – need to do if you want to go to the next level and so um, I began to, to model those ways anytime he would come back I would uh, listen to his uh, listen to his um, advice so I spent a lot of time working out um, staying out of trouble yeah staying out of the trouble but just in terms of um, not the trouble that you know would get me into you know jail or this and that didn't do drugs and or none of that stuff and uh, you know, uh, my hard work paid off, had a decent junior year and uh, started getting these letters in the mail um, from colleges to um, pay to go to their football camp, which I didn't have that kind of money. You know, I was raised by my grandma, both of my great grandparents definitely provided me with a, a great way of life. Yeah. But these camps were five, six hundred, seven hundred dollars. So I did end up getting a job this summer. I knew how important putting myself out there so others can can see what I could bring to the table. You know, uh, Absolutely. I'm of Arkansas, a ton of talent, but you didn't have a lot of colleges, uh, a lot of folks that were, you know, coming down to check us out. So um, I got to this letter, this camp, it was only $150. I said, okay, I can afford this. And I looked up the flight to go to where this camp would be. It's only 220 bucks. I could afford this. I was working at the movie theater. Yeah. And lo and behold, it was the University of Nebraska. <laughs> never okay. heard of, never heard of the Cornhuskers, man. You know, uh, this was late nineties, mid nineties. It was all about Notre Dame. It was all about Florida State. Yeah. Um, but little did I know, Nebraska was right there winning these national championships. I just never saw them on TV. But yeah. I simply wanted an opportunity to go to college. So I flew myself to this camp, spent the whole summer working out, getting, you know, faster, bigger, stronger. And uh, went to the camp, impressed the coaches. And uh, that's when I got on their radar. And all they told me was to get my grades up get a 20 on the ACT, which at the time my highest score was an 18 and stay out of trouble. Yeah. Maybe and a scholarship would open up. I did those things. And next thing you know, the rest was history. 1998, that, I became a Husker. That's awesome. So I want to, I want to go through, there's so much good, good stuff in there. So I'm, I'm going to rewind it a little bit. Cause I want to ask you about this and you know, you mentioned it, having a, an example, like a Tory Hunter, you know, in, in your community is a big deal. And, you know, as young males and females, you know, you're so impressionable 
what was it about Tori? I mean, obviously playing professional sports is one cool thing, but what else was it about Tori that really was an example that you wanted to follow? You know, I would say his work ethic, you know, he was always uh, trying to do things that would better himself. Mm-hmm. You know, it's certain things that, that people do um, that others do and they think it's OK, such as getting high or you know, yep. running the streets or getting into trouble. I mean, you know, when you see it so much, it tends to become normal. But Tory uh, didn't do what was normal. And, and so that somewhat stood out to me. And, and that, I would say, uh, is something that I wanted to follow. Everyone wanted to be like Tory Hunter, but no one was willing to make the sacrifices Bingo. and do what it took to be like a Tory Hunter. And so I'm I'm very thankful that um, I had that mindset and that attitude. There were so many athletes, and still are, in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, that have the potential to go to that next level. But to get to that next level, it takes sacrifice, it takes commitment, and you have to make that that willing choice to to do what it takes even if it makes you somewhat an outlier yeah so i was seen as an outlier and uh going to nebraska was definitely never heard of but <laughs> right once but once people saw me on tv they realized that okay Des Moines made a huge decision and um i have no regrets of I love um, that. Uh, going to the university of nebraska wing I love that. So thinking about that, you mentioned, hey, the junior year was kind of the year that you got put on the map. Um, you know, you said you started getting recruited. I mean, sometimes you hear stories about, well, you know, freshman, sophomore year, I wasn't even playing. And then finally, I got an opportunity junior year. Sometimes it's, hey, I just, you know, I wasn't in peak performance mode yet. I grew. What was it about your junior year that was the catalyst to, you know, really start having great seasons? You know, my junior year was when I realized I actually had a little bit of speed. I was only maybe 215 pounds, but I spent a lot of time at uh, the Hunter's house. So Tory, his brothers, um, Taru, Tram, Tishku. Uh, so um, we was all cool. And yeah. um, so Tory's older brother, Taru, had a bench press. Okay. Uh, and, and, and he was the one that was always working out. You know, growing up, I was a chubby kid. And, and so, um, you know, anything that, that I could do just to have that growth spurt or, to, or just to change my body image, I would give the credit to Teru Hunter. Okay. Uh, there were times when no one was at the house and I would find a way to get in their house <laughs> just, just to work out. And they still to this day give me a hard time about that. But, you know, it paid off. Right. And so with that speed and with that strength, uh, when I was out there, I just gave 100%. And by me giving 100%, good things happened. Plays were made. Sacks were made. Yeah. And again, I never saw myself as a superstar. I just wanted to be a hard worker. I just wanted to play the game of football. And just simply with that attitude, opportunities presented themselves. Um, you know, I, I was a first generation student, you know, neither of my parents graduated from a four year college, yep. uh, but yet it was a dream of all of us that grew up in a neighborhood was to go to the next level. I'm just grateful for the mentors in my life, people like Tori who uh, modeled the way and then others who maybe didn't make it, but they mm-hmm. took the time to share some of their failures yes. as learning lessons, you know, to help me. And so Pine Bluff is definitely a, a, still my home, still my heart, because they wanted to make sure, hey, I didn't make it, but let me help you, young blood, so yep. you can make it. So I love so much about what you talked about right there. I mean, I think there are a lot of mentors in your life that you're like, I, I hope to replicate that or even exceed that, right? Like, because I want to be where they're at. But a lot of the mentors in our life are just people that have maybe made choices that because we were around and we saw that are good mentors, meaning, hey, I decided not to make that same choice because I was able to learn from their mistakes. So that's a that's a great point. But I want to also dig into something else you talked about where you said, 
you know, Tori did things differently than everyone else. And that gave me an example, right? As a good mentor of, all right, these are the things I should be doing. So that's a business life, uh, business principle. That's a life principle. It's an athletic principle, right? You have to do the uncommon thing to get an uncommon result. What for you internally, you know, really allowed you to stay on the straight and narrow of continuing to do the uncommon? You know, I would say growing up as a kid, I was already considered that different kid. You know, yeah. I grew up, you know, having a stutter. And so, of course, you know, I, I was picked on. I was excluded. You know, what wasn't the most popular? As I mentioned, I was chubby, wasn't the smartest kid. Uh, so, you know, had to take some of those special ed classes that didn't make me feel so special. So, right. you know, I was <laughs> somewhat quiet and shy growing up. So I was all, already this different kid. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me to, to do the uncommon, to uh, have the courage uh, not to be a follower, but little did I know, all of the little different things that I did turned me into a leader. And keep in mind, leadership to me at that time was someone who was outspoken, who was tall, right. who was popular, who was smart. Uh, but it wasn't until I got to Nebraska that you can be a leader by example. Yep. And so I would say, you know, even today, that's um, one of the messages that, that, I, that I always like to emphasize is that, you know, leadership sometimes is about your example. Sometimes it takes courage, you know, to be able to do the uncommon, to, to not be a follower of society. Uh, if you truly want to make a difference and, and reach your full potential, and I'm very fortunate, you know, that I was able to be in a position to reach my full potential uh, as a high school student, uh, as an athlete, you know, in college, and even as I pursue, you know, a little professional football, but even just in my everyday, um, I would say, uh, just, just mode, zone. Yep. Um, it's all about leadership. It's, 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 it's all about of uh, doing the things that help you to be your best, not just to get the job done, but my motto is, what can I do to get the job won? I love it. That's great. Don't just get done, get it won. I like get that. Get it won every I like day. It. I love it. So you attend the camp in Lincoln then. And once again, they kind of gave you, hey, you got to do these things and maybe you'll get this scholarship offer. So yep. at what point, you know, as a senior, did the scholarship offer come? And was there any, hey, maybe I want to look at these other schools? Or once you had showed up to Lincoln, uh, did you just know that that's the spot I want to go? You know, um, Arkansas State was the first, I would say, school that, that actually noticed me. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, I, I was very fortunate, you know, to even have someone to say, hey, we want you. Yep. Uh, Baylor was the second couple other small schools, but even hearing the word maybe from uh, former head coach Tom Osborne gave me that motivation to go back to Pine Bluff, keep working hard, uh, make the grades, take the ACT again and again and again. And so maybe to some others, it's like, uh, you know, not enough, right. but that was just enough hope, you know, that gave me that window and it was up to me yep. because you know if you really think about it we all make choices and uh, I always say we win or lose by how we choose mm -hmm. and I truly believe that I won that scholarship because of the choices that I made when I went back to Pine Bluff the sacrifices and and, and simply um, not seeing um, a challenge or an obstacle or an 18 on ACT or 2.5 GPA uh, as a period, but yep. really uh, turning those periods into commas simply by being resilient, by being determined, by setting goals for myself. Because if you don't set goals for yourself, you'll find yourself comparing yourself with other folks. And so that's, that's so good. something that I've never uh, done. I've always have done things differently. People have considered me somewhat weird or different, but you know, yeah. the difference that I have made has come from me being different. Absolutely. Well, and you know what, what's always interesting to me is 
no one, well, I shouldn't say no one, very few people aspire to be like the mentor that does it the same as everyone else, right? The people that we yeah. look up to most are the people that did it differently. It, but to do it differently, you have to really step outside of your comfort zone because it's, right, you're looked at differently. So yeah, there's that weird paradox there of, well, you have to do things differently to be uh, viewed as a mentor a lot of times. But as you're doing the weird things before you get the result, people maybe question that. So that's yes, great. That's great. So you, you show up on campus and anyone that played collegiate athletics knows there is just a jump going from high school to college. Like, I mean, there just is, it doesn't matter what level that it's faster guys are. I mean, you know, I, I remember for me, it was like, that guy looks like he's 30, you know, and I looked about 12. So, you know, there's just the age gap. Talk to me a little bit about the transition for you from high school into college and what that looked like. You know, I would say I did have one advantage when I got to college, I was bench pressing 400 pounds. Um, and so in terms of strength and speed, I was able to keep up with some of those other um, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. My disadvantage was I was a 6'2", 230 pound undersized defensive end from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Who was this kid? How did yeah. he get his college? You know, I wasn't rated your four-star, five-star. Mm -hmm. But yet one of the things that gave me another advantage was my work ethic. Yep. Uh, just growing up, my grandparents, friends, peers, mentors, they taught me the value of hard work. You don't receive anything, you have to earn it. Yep. And so uh, as, 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 as much as it was discouraging to see some of those other defensive ends that were taller, bigger than me, some of those offensive linemen that were just huge, I just but, simply have to just trust my ability, trust that they brought me to Nebraska for a reason. Mm -hmm. And once I focus on my strengths instead of my weaknesses, that's what helped me to be successful. And so I always stress to others, Focus on what's right about you, not what's wrong. Focus on what you can do, not what you can't. Focus on your strengths, not your weaknesses. Because you win or lose by how you choose. Yep. And I was able to, like I say, uh, my red shirt freshman year, got some time on the field. And by the time that I was a sophomore, I had earned my black shirt. Oh. Not because I was the biggest or the tallest, but simply my work ethic and just simply focusing on why they brought me to Nebraska. And that was to simply hit that edge and get to their quarterback. That's so good. As you were saying that, there's a book by Malcolm Gladwell called David and Goliath. And yes, the whole premise of the book is if you, from an outsider's view, if you didn't know anything about the situation, you would think there's always these, you know, astronomical like percentage odds that something shouldn't happen. But when you really dig into it, and if you focus on the things that are maybe perceived as a weakness, but how they can benefit you, you know, it actually can almost tilt things in your favor. So to your point, opposed to saying, well, gosh, I'm not, you know, as tall as these guys. So th this just isn't going to be my position. He said, all right, well, what do I have? Well, I probably have abnormal strength for, you know, the size I am, but also second, I'm, I'm quick. So, all right, how do I learn to be able to use that in my moves? And how do I pick moves that are going to uh, you know, really exploit or show the fact that I'm quick and I can use those to beat a guy that's stronger than me. So I love that. That's a great focus. So yes, and that's a yeah. great and that's a great book, by the way. And yeah. just the whole David and Goliath story in, in the Bible is, is one that I would say helped me um, go against. Um, still remember Rose Bowl junior year. Brian right. McKinney for Miami. <laughs> yeah. He was like 6'9", 370 pounds. And so um, to me, I was the David. He was the Goliath. And uh, even though we lost that game, uh, I would say it was probably one of my, my best games because I think I had maybe three, four solo tackles. Didn't get to the quarterback, but uh, was still able to keep that edge. Uh, was going against an uh, All-American tight end, uh, Jeremy Shockey. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, David and Goliath, I, 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 I can definitely relate to old David. I love it. That's great. 
So while you're playing there, I mean, obviously becoming a black shirt's a big deal. Getting the opportunity to start at that level. And I mean, you were, you know, all conference and, you know, I mean, competing at a high, high level. What were some of the, you know, principles or leadership things you learned, you know, either being a leader of the team or from coaches that you were able to interact with at your uh, time at Nebraska? You know, I would say uh, first and foremost, I had to learn by failing. You know, my first semester, I got a 1.69 because I thought I was at Nebraska simply to play football. <laughs> right. I didn't take advantage of the resources, the mentoring, all of the steak and chicken and protein that they was giving us. I was simply jacking around for the first time in my life. I'm somebody. I got this freedom. And so um, it took uh, being put on academic probation. It took Dennis LeBlanc, who was my advisor um, for holding me accountable, sending people to class to make sure that I was in class, forcing me to go to study hall every single night and taking advantage of those resources that were in place for every student athlete to be successful on and off the field. Yeah. That's when things turned around. That was the game changer, was simply learning how to ask for help. And that I was will. hard. Yes. But, yeah. Well, and so yeah, I want to so, I want to highlight that really quick though, because as we'll find out, the fact that you had that trouble right away might be the catalyst for what you've been able to do since and what you finished up doing in your undergrad, right? I mean, if I understand correctly, I think you might have had some all conference accolades on the academic side as well, and then you get a master's. So talk about how like learning that right away or you know early on in your you know collegiate career ended up you know helping out in the back half you know once I realized that seeing a tutor asking for help doesn't make you less of a student it doesn't make you incompetent it actually helps you to be your best you know teamwork is what makes the dream work and so once I took full advantage of those resources those tutoring uh, services and just simply having folks like Dennis LeBlanc Keith Zimmer some of the the older upper class football players to hold me accountable. Um, that's when I realized for me to be my best, um, you know, I can only get so far alone, but you know, together I can get farther. And yep. so first semester finished with nine credit hours. And next thing you know, I'm graduating in three years with, with five minors, which was I love very unheard of. Yeah. <laughs> while being um, a, a, a second team academic All-American. And so uh, I give credit to Dennis LeBlanc to this day and all of the resources that they put, put into place, asking for help because that helped me to be the first to graduate from a four-year college uh, in my family. That, that helped me to be a three-time All-Big 12 uh, academic list and second team uh, academic All-American, but most importantly, receiving a college degree and starting my master's while I was a football player. Yes. Um, so I, I still, uh, still to this day, um, never take for granted asking for help. I have mentors still to this day. Uh, I take advantage of resources, books, and just looking at people who are successful, but looking at people who have failed and using those failures as learning lessons so that, you know, I can get as far as I can, but we cannot get as far as we can in life by doing things alone. It takes teamwork. And I'm very grateful that the University of Nebraska being on uh, the Husker football team taught me that. That's awesome. Yeah. And the, the thing about it is, you know, to your point, you were willing to ask for help. And I think sometimes you know, we get egos, right? Um, you, you could have been like, hey, I'm a division one football player. Like, I'm not gonna ask for help, right? I mean, especially at a high level team, yeah. uh, there's people in business, right? They get a certain level of success and like, ah, I'm not gonna ask for help. And if we can humble ourselves and say, hey, there might be someone out there that either knows more than me or knows better than me, uh, I should seek out guidance. I think that's a huge win. Yes, yes. It is a win-win when you can just tag team and um, brainstorm with others, troubleshoot, um, and just if you want to be someone or get on that certain level, 
find that person or those individuals and, and find out what they did and imitate that. Right. Uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, by nature, you know, what we see is what we get. We, we model what we follow. And so uh, I had to learn the hard way at first. I was following models that, you know, I thought would make me cool and popular. You know, I did think that, you know, I was invisible, that I could do whatever I wanted to do and I would get those results. But I learned that you can't expect something by doing nothing. That's and great. And so uh, I would say, um, learned the hard way, but sometimes you got to lose to win. Yep. And so uh, that's uh, a message that I also stress to, to folks when I have the opportunity. Sometimes you have to lose to win. Maybe you have to lose uh, the, the ideal of being cool, or you have to lose some of those um, poor habits. Maybe you have to, to lose um, certain attitudes or just uh, maybe a mentality that, that you had growing up and just take ownership of, again, your growth mindset. Yep. Maybe I'm not good right now, but I'm not good yet. Yep. And, and so just, just that yet provides that calm, which allows you to continue. Whereas so many people make the mistake of putting a period where they should be putting a comma. Yep. A failure and a loss are never final unless you make it final, right? You always have the chance to bounce back from that. So that's yes, good. Yes, sir. Now, in your time at Nebraska, did you have a teammate that was a mentor or a coach that you really looked up to as a mentor? You know, uh, I would say so many coaches, you know, Turner Gill, uh, I would say uh, he uh, spent a lot of time um, actually, you know, checking me out, making sure that I was doing my part uh, so that he could provide Coach Osborne enough in information that, you know, I at least had something to bring to the table. Uh, Coach Ron Brown uh, was also a mentor, you know, um, growing up, um, you know, my grandparents in, instilled a lot of values and, and beliefs around my faith in, in, in Jesus Christ. And so mm. Ron Brown, although he was quiet, but yet he was very, very uh, one of those um, hardcore uh, aggressive in a good way coaches on the field yeah but off the field he was a man of God um, and so uh, he helped me um, in addition to being involved with the fellowship of Christian athletes kind of gave me that anchor to uh, to stay out of trouble I still got into some trouble but man <laughs> you know if it wasn't for those coaches other players uh, Aaron Wills um Aaron Turpinen, who was a good friend of mine, Patrick Abungo, Keo Craver and I, we were roommates pretty much the entire time. We held each other accountable. I graduated in three years. He graduated in three and a half. Love it. He was an All-American. I was an academic All-American. He got drafted. We still had fun, but yet, uh, you know, Keo, that was my boy. And we both knew where we wanted to go. Mm -hmm. and, we and we held each other accountable. And so, you know, once you see where you're going, everything you do must correspond with where you're going. And, and so I'm thankful for guys like him, coaches that I just mentioned, and so many other people, you know, who um, I would give credit to that, that helped me to be successful on and off the field at Nebraska. I love it. And once again, I'm going to point this out. You're just a humble guy, and I love that about you, but you, you had to be willing to take the direction, right? And I think there's something to be said about that because you could probably rattle off a list of 10 or 20 teammates that had all the same opportunities as you but didn't get the same end result. And so, you know, once again, I do want to point that out. You're, you're a humble man. I love that about you. But, you know, you had to be willing to take that and, uh, and surround yourself with those folks. So that's great. Now, as you're finishing up college uh, and football season, you know, is winding down, what, what are the next things going through your head? And I mean, talk to me a little bit about that progression for you. Wow. So my junior year was my best year. Um, I think I led the team in sacks. Um, that's what set me up to somewhat, you know, be a, you know, potential prospect to get drafted. Yeah. Uh, for the NFL, my senior year, you know, we were ranked number one. You know, we, we, we lost that game against Colorado. Uh, we still got to the Rose Bowl. We lost that right. game, but yet 
you know, every year I was at Nebraska, we were ranked in the top 10. So our senior year, uh, Chris Kelsey, who was on the other side, dominant defensive end. I mean, the one gross All-American. And we had Baird Rude, who was stepping up early, and, and, and he was killing it. I mean, we had so many weapons, and we went 7-7. Seven and seven. Yep. And so because of not just the record, but um, – my performance went down. I, you know, gained too much weight. I thought that's what the NFL needed to see was a mm. bigger defensive end. And so um, I kind of lost focus on what I was good at, which was my speed. And instead I got distracted by focusing on what I felt others needed to see. Got it. And um, it didn't benefit me. And so I didn't get drafted. And that was devastating because that was, I, I was sure that was just the next step, an easy step. And so uh, I was somewhat lost after I didn't get drafted. As much as I had a degree and I was working on my master's, um, it was a, a mental, emotional setback when I did not get drafted, when I had other friends and other players that got drafted, who we all played together, had that same um, just ability, yeah. talent. It was devastating. So, so let's talk about that. I mean, I appreciate you, one, being transparent on just that. that that's a devastating thing. Now, once again, um, and I'm sure you're going to hint on the, or talk on this and hint towards it, but, you know, mindset's such a big deal, right? I mean, there are, once again, are plenty of stories about that exact same scenario and things go off the, you know, the deep end for people. But what was it for you or who was it for you that allowed you to, you know, regain and what did that process look like for you to go from, you know, that disappointment uh, and, and still progress forward? You know, I would say for months, uh, you know, I ended up just standing Lincoln, uh, continuing my, my, my graduate work. Uh, but I, I was also embarrassed because, you know, just to talk, the hype and for me not to, get drafted it was kind of embarrassing and so I um, kind of hid myself I avoided certain folks certain conversations because I, I just didn't want to talk about it and so I somewhat became just a normal student just wanted to go to school but yet there was still something inside of me that that felt you know I have what it takes but what ESPN and these other people were saying and, and, the, the, and the critiques and everything, um, it just discouraged me. And granted, I had other opportunities. I, I could have did arena ball. I could have did Canadian, but I felt I should have been in the NFL. And so I was embarrassed. And so it was over the Christmas break, I went home and my dad had this, this, this talk with me and he just encouraged me that, you know, what do I have to lose simply by just giving it a shot? Yeah. Go out and, you know, just see what happens because I didn't see, I didn't, I, I didn't even attempt to, to, to put myself out there once I didn't get drafted. And so he is the one that they gave me the courage to just give it a shot. And so I spent the entire spring going to all of these different tryouts, running a 40, doing a vertical jump, doing a bench press and all of these things and the rejections and we like you, but, and no phone calls. And man, it just wore out my ego until I did get a call back from the Edmonton Eskimos willing to give me a shot to get on the field. And so um, in the spring of 2004, Ended up becoming an Edmonton Eskimo because I still had football. I, I still had life. I lost all of that weight. Yep. And I began to take ownership again of that speed and that strength. And I spent a year and a half up there. And that's when, after that year and a half of getting more experience and just showing that, hey, I have something to bring to the table. Yep. That's when I got that opportunity with the Green Bay Packers. I love it. I mean, the, it, it's an underlying theme, I think, with everyone that reaches certain levels of success, and that is they had failure after failure, but they were willing to keep going, 
right? I mean, so many people, failure one, failure two, failure three, or miss, not the opportunity they want, not the opportunity, not the opportunity. All right, I'm just done. But inside of you, you had that burning desire to go get that. So what was the feeling like when you got that phone call? I mean, I, I can only imagine like, hey, I've been pouring into this for years and then finally getting that opportunity. You know, um, I was humbled. You know, it was an opportunity that big picture, it would give me the additional experience, playing time, so that I could get to that NFL level. Um, and I, I embraced it. And so um, I put my graduate work on hold and um, the Canadian Football League uh, went from May through November. And then in the off season, which was January through May, I would go back to Lincoln, work out, and just continue my schooling. Because in the back of my mind, I knew one day um, I would need a real job. <laughs> and right. so, yeah, 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 because football is a short-term career. And so I did not want to make the mistake of putting all of my eggs in the basket. And once football said, we don't love you no more, um, then I would be stuck not having no sense of purpose or sense of direction. And that day did come in 2008 when the game of football stopped loving me. I had to get a real job. But I can say after somewhat the disappointment, the embarrassment, uh, that setback, or as I would say, kind of getting tackled and, and, and knocked down, um, I got back up. I didn't get back up right away. Yep. But it's that resiliency mm -hmm. that that helps all of us get to that goal. It's not always easy to, to score that touchdown. You get tackled, but you get back up. And uh, I'm thankful for my father for just uh, giving me that wisdom, the encouragement, and just others for just still believing in me and, and, and caring about me uh, behind the jersey, um, behind the helmet and um, just caring for me as a person. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, you know, life is all about, you know, others. And I definitely give credit to others because if it wasn't for just some of those other individuals, I would have continued to put myself in that bubble of embarrassment, of that bubble of just being devastated. But uh, I still have more left in the tank. And uh, even though I did not get to become that superstar that I wanted in the NFL, my story is they said that I didn't have what it took, but I ended up showing them. I ended up breaking through the door yes. uh, just to, to this day to share with others, hey, uh, winners never quit and quitters never win. Man, I'm ready to run through a wall right now. Like, let's go. Let's go. I'm ready to run through a wall. I absolutely love it. That's good. So, I mean, that, that's such an amazing thing, but it also makes me think of what, you know, you felt that such a sense of accomplishment, you know, accomplishing that goal that you'd wanted to on the football field. How about on the academic side? I mean, you know, being the first time college graduate and then also getting a master's, you know, it makes me think of my mom. That's, that's exactly her story. You know, first first person in her family to graduate, then she gets a master, you know, in additional things. And so for you, what did that mean to you? And what did that feel like as well? You know, I would say it really made my mom, my dad, and my grandparents proud. Yeah. Um, you know, education, you know, school is important. And, you know, as a kid growing up, I did my best, but it, it just didn't come natural to me. Mm -hmm. But I knew it was important. And, and so uh, I wanted to make sure that um, I took care of the business that I needed to so that in the future I could do what I wanted to. Um, I knew education was was the key. Um, and to even have the opportunity to receive a master's and, you know, and then begin pursuing a Ph.D., is a huge deal when it comes to certain careers that maybe you want to pursue and yeah. just um, giving you that platform, putting yourself in, in that position. You know, it took the Dennis LeBlancs, it, it, it took people like my dad and it just, just other folks that helped me to get that. 
I must say, because, you know, naturally I'm an introvert, I tend to listen more than I talk. You know, I pay attention. My, my awareness is kind of like a dog. I'm always just listening and watching and just paying attention. And uh, I realized how important a degree would help me big picture. Yep. Football, yes, it's, it's great short term, but man, once the dream stopped loving me and I'm trying to get an interview for this job and this job, we spent a lot of time talking about football, but at the end of the interview, it was like, well, Des Moines, uh, because you don't have enough work experience, right? we simply can't hire you. Yep. And that's when it hit me that, you know, football is great. It, it's a great entertainment for a lot of folks but there's so much more that you need in order to be successful in life. Not just a degree, but career readiness, life skills, how to communicate, how to interact with others. Um, and so those things came along later, yep. but football taught me all of those things, but I would say they began to come out in such a way that would help me to be a professional uh, once I got my first job in 2008. I love it. Well, the thing that I also think about just as you were saying all of that is and you had made this comment earlier that uh, when you showed up to Nebraska, it was one of the first times you felt like a leader could be someone that led by example. It wasn't necessarily the most outgoing person. And I also just think about how you, what you've been able to accomplish. Oh, and I mean, you're a young guy, but only up to this point, what you're going to accomplish past it how it's rewriting, you know, expectations that your family legacy will carry on. And I think, you know, that's going to be, you know, the most rewarding part of all of that is, you know, Hey, you, you were the first to do it, but now what's the legacy that's able to build off of that. So that's what I was thinking about as you said, yes. I love it. Yes. And, 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 you know, I definitely don't want to be the last. Yep. And, and so, uh, you know, hopefully my example will influence others, will give others hope, knowing that you may try something, you may not get the results you want right away, but keep trying, be resilient, have, have that sense of grit. Mm -hmm. Because when the going gets tough, that's when we must get tougher. And so uh, I would say that is something that I live by to this day. Uh, life tends to put periods, you know, doing certain you know goals that we set or a journey that we uh, may be on so to speak but um, things like hope things like optimism being positive those are the commas that we need to replace those periods with uh, because you know our only limit is us yep. because every single day it's it's when we look in a mirror it's it's you versus you Right. And so, you know, it's either we're going to give our best effort or we're going to give our best excuse. And, and, and so we we have to compete against ourselves every single day, those doubts, those fears. Um, and so every day it's a competition. And I play this game of life to win. Yes, sir. I love it. Now, Des Moines, a after football is all said and done, to your point, you, you come back and you start working and different jobs, you're able to, you know, connect with uh, Coach Osborne and work with him and, you know, really help grow the teammates program, which is, you know, just an absolute blessing, uh, you know, across the state and, you know, even outside the state of Nebraska. While you're doing that, though, you start pursuing an opportunity to uh, publicly speak at some of these schools and different institutions. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, how the partnership with Coach Osborne and, and teammates came about, but then also, you know, where the idea to start speaking with uh, different, you know, groups of young individuals and, uh, you know, companies came from. You know, the first time I ever spoke was when I was in college. You know, of course, they would always ask, you know, uh, football players to maybe go talk to a school to yeah. encourage them to say no to drugs or the importance of, you know, academics and things like that. My involvement with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes is really what inspired me uh, mm -hmm. to, I guess, get in front of a group of people and share my story. Yeah. Um, keep in mind, I grew up having a stutter. And right, even in right. college, I still had a stutter. And to this day, I still have a stutter. But it was something about the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. It was something about 
uh, that organization really uh, just putting my faith on fire. And again, taking that next level of, okay, you know, it's not me, but there's someone bigger that's using me. You bet. Um, and, and, and my ultimate purpose, um, FCA is what gave me those opportunities to speak. And so I continued to do little things, little things. But then in 2008, when someone asked me that million dollar question, if you could do something for the rest of your life and get paid for it, what would it be? And I said, you know, I wouldn't mind being a motivational speaker. Mm. So so that's when my guy, Aaron Davis, uh, who was also a good friend and mentor, took me by his wings and helped me to do this and that to put myself in a position so that I can have my own platform, my own product and become my own business. Um, and so I would say in 2010 is when officially I became a motivational speaker. And so here we are 10 years later, I've been doing it and I feel like I'm just getting started Yeah. because as the Huskers like to say, feel day by day, that's right. We only get better and better. Can't and be so, beat. Um, Yes, yes, yes. So uh, just that the heart to help others, to motivate others, to provide hope and inspiration and positivity, also helping others to understand what it takes to be a winner in life, to be a winner in anything that you do, giving people a game plan. We all need a game plan. So many people want to set goals, whether it's to, to lose weight or to make more money or to be a better husband or to, to do this, but yet if they don't know what it takes and if they don't have the will um, behind the skill, it's not going to happen. And so I've just simply um, have just learned how to use those football experiences, life failures, but then also just awareness, um, leadership, um, and just so many other things. And, 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 I, and I put that together in this ready, set, perform product yep. that, that when I have the opportunity to inspire young kids and, and adults, um, to me, that's my calling. That's my purpose in life. When I'm no longer in life and when others are speaking about Des Moines Adams, um, the sacks, the number of hours I spent writing papers, they're not gonna talk about that. I want them to talk about the impact that I had on people. I want them to talk about the the influence and I hope others would um, be inspired to, you know, to do the impossible, to know that Des Moines stuttered, but yet he was able to to grow out of it or Des Moines failed, but yet he didn't see that as a sign to quit. He saw it as a sign to get back up. Yeah. And so it's something that I enjoy doing on the side. Um, teammates definitely uh, provided me uh, with that opportunity uh, to do that alongside um, helping others to understand the power of a young person having a mentor. Oh my gosh. And so yeah. I was able to work with teammates for almost eight years. Um, great organization. Um, and I would say when I first started, teammates was only in Nebraska and Iowa. By the time I left, it was also in South Dakota, Wyoming, and Kansas. And so to impact over 10,000 students by giving wow. them a mentor was incredible. And uh, very fortunate that Tom Osborne recruited me a second time yeah. to be on his second team called teammates. And so, yeah, um, incredible um, work that I try to put my hands on. And so over the last year, I've been uh, with the University of Nebraska Foundation, which is also an incredible organization, which uh, is all about securing resources so that the University of Nebraska can make a difference, make a positive difference by providing a quality education so more students can get a career, not just a job, but connecting people back to their alumni so that they can think about what their legacy looks like. Yeah, uh, I love that. Uh, there, there's a lot of good things in there, but the one thing that I want to say is, and it's just a testament to your character, uh, you know, who you are on and off the field and, you know, what your time in Nebraska looked like that, 
you know, Coach Osborne, to your point, wanted to recruit you a second time. Because once again, I'm sure there's certain <laughs> people that uh, get recruited once and you go, probably wouldn't do that again. And then there's other guys, you know, like yourself, where, uh, you know, it comes full circle and even after football, you know, want to maintain a relationship. So that's awesome. Good. So now I have two very pointed questions that I want to kind of close our time out with. Okay. All so right. the first one is this, uh, it's been a phrase that I heard years ago and it's really been one of my like focal points in my life. And it's this idea of blissful dissatisfaction. Okay. So that's a lot, uh, you know, those are two intriguing words that combine, but it's the idea that there are certain people in life that when they hit their first goal, they plateau. And, you know, it's like, hey, I hit that goal. So I, I hit my goal. Let's just keep doing that. There are other people in life. I think you and I would fall into that category where it's like, I hit my goal, but now I want to do more, right? I want what's next? What's what else can I do? But the problem that can arise from that is you accomplish so much. But since you're always focused on the next thing, you don't take time to look back and think about all the amazing things that you've done. So for yourself, once again, I mean, you've done so much. How do you balance that, yeah. right? How do you balance like feeling satisfied with hitting a goal, but yet striving for more and, uh, you know, not losing that fire to do more? You know, I would say uh, my family um, yeah. is, is, is one thing that, that helps me to have that balance, to, to think more that I have to have a balance, you know, having a wife and kids and wanting to make sure that, you know, I'm present, that I'm being not just a role model to all of these thousands of other people, that, but that I'm, I'm a role model here at home and that I'm using those same strengths and skills here at, at home. That's one of the things that, that keep me balanced. But I tell you, it is tough because I am definitely not one who is okay with just being okay. I've never, never been that kind of person. And I've never been the type of person to sit back and smell the roses. Once I achieve a goal, I'm like, okay, what's next? Yep, yep. And so I'm on next goal. I'm, I'm not a nine to five type of guy. I'm not a five day a week work type of guy. Yep. I'm someone who, again, takes pride in getting the job won. Yep. And so, um, which is a blessing and it's a curse. But I can tell you what, um, I may not be the smartest, but uh, I will make sure that I'm one of the hardest working people uh, that you will ever encounter. Uh, because competition, again, is, is never me and someone else. It's, it's, it's always us. We always have to compete against our own selves of, of being our yes. best. And so uh, I want to try to be the best that I can be at home in yep. my friendships and in my relationships. And this thing called character, character is never a destination. It is an yep. everyday grind. Mm, you always have to work on your character, just like you got to stay in shape. Um, and so um, definitely not perfect by any means. Um, I'm just very grateful, very blessed. And uh, that's why I can never just uh, sit here and just brag and, and be so confident uh, in the things that I have achieved because there were so, so many uh, people that have helped me. And there are others who are just as good, just as talented, just as blessed, but yet um, whatever happened, yep. something, an obstacle, a setback, life, a choice, uh, things just didn't work out. Um, and so uh, any of us, anything at, at any time, something can happen. And so that's when I have to remind myself, I have to be grateful. I have to really focus on the moment. Because at any given moment, you know, just thinking of COVID and the pandemic, yes. uh, right now, I'm very blessed to have a job. But who knows if um, one day the foundation decides to close their door. So I, I, I need to embrace every moment um, and smell the roses as much as I can, yeah. but never get content. I love it. That's great. All right. And then the last point of question. For the people that you allow into your close circle, what is the one <laughs> or two characteristics that you look for or really uh, desire to have in the people that are close to you? Uh, Philip, you put me on the spot because my I circle do. is very small. And, you know, yes. uh, you know, this is something that I have to be 
honest about, and it's something that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people, I have a lot of relationships, but I don't have a lot of friendships mm -hmm. simply because I just can't get caught up in a lot of crap. Yeah. You know, I have to be around like-minded people, people that think like me, people that uh, enjoy talking about life and bettering themselves versus crap on social media and anger and, and, and all of the things that only feed into your worst side. Yep. I want to be around people that are all about feeding, you know, things that help them to be their best. Yep. How can they help me to be my best? Not that I'm selfish, but yet, you know, we only get one life, man. Sometimes yeah. we only get one chance and we don't get second chances. And so I'm very selective about the people that I decide to have in my small circle and it's very few. But those people that are in my small circle, they're like-minded, um, they value life. They value the things that are meaningful. Yeah. Um, and they also value... Um, me, who I am, not just because I played in Nebraska, not just because I played in the NFL, not just because I'm doing all of these motivational speakings and I'm making this impact. Yeah. They value the person who I am. They know me and they appreciate me, my imperfections, my, my, my faults. Um, and so if someone can't appreciate that, then they're just not a relationship. Yep, absolutely. I love it. I love it. Well, Des Moines, I appreciate the heck out of your time, man. I, uh, you know, I hope everyone that listened, I mean, I hope you would repeat and listen to this again, just all the great takeaways. I mean, you know, from, you know, the, the way we look at life events and the way we view our, you know, good or bad qualities or strong or not as strong qualities is a choice. Uh, you know, the fact that Des Moines is willing to say, you know what, I, I could do these things, but because I want this more, I'm going to say no to these things so I can get what I want most. But Des Moines, you're doing amazing things. You've already impacted so many people, but, you know, continuing on with your uh, work with the foundation and uh, speaking and who knows, whatever else is uh, out there as, as you and I have known each other, I know there's still more yet to come and uh, I'll be excited to get to learn about the journey as we go. Yes. Well, again, I tell people all of the time, I'm just getting started. So I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be uh, on your podcast today. Um, I, I hope this will inspire somebody, even if it's just somebody, you know, to me, that's a win. So Phil, continue to do great work, continue to use your platform to do good. And I'm proud of you as well, my friend. Appreciate it, sir.